Welcome to the Neutral Podcast, where we discuss paving the way to a sustainable tomorrow. I'm Nate Helbach, your host, founder, and CEO of The Neutral Project, a sustainable real estate development company. Join us each week as we host world-renowned guests and explore dynamic landscapes of real estate development, alternative investing, sustainability, forestry, urbanism, and new cutting edge carbon neutral construction materials that are shaping the cities of tomorrow. Welcome back to the Neutral Podcast. We are joined by Douglas Lyons, who is managing principal of ProMark with the responsibility for the firm's capital markets and debt investment activities. He is also a member of the firm's management investment committees. Prior to joining ProMark in 1996, Mr. Lyons served as Vice President of Equity Institutional Investors, Inc., with the responsibility for merchant banking activities and strategic portfolio management projects for Zell Merrill Lynch uh, Real Estate Opportunity Funds, the Zell Chomark Funds, and other Sam Zell-related aff- affiliates. In addition, Mr. Lyons managed an in- institutional portfolio of REIT stocks. Prior to joining the Zell organization, he worked in the New York Real Estate Capital Markets Group for Bankers Trust Company and Merrill Lynch & Co. Mr. Lyons is on the Harvard Alumni Real Estate Board and is a member of the Pension Real Estate Association. He serves as the trustee for the Urban Land Interests and for the Loomis Schaefe School, chairing its Building and Grounds Committee. Mr. Lyons earned his BA in History from Amherst College and his MBA from Harvard University Graduate School. Welcome on, Doug. Thanks for uh, joining. Thanks, and Nate. It's uh, great here. to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, how I got to know Doug, just as a way of background, uh, Doug's firm, Promark, financed our first project to Madison Baker's Place, and they were the mez lender on it. And so we... Uh, got to know each other through that transaction. And since then I've been in several other meetings and have gotten to know each other. It's been great to know you. It's um, been great to get to know you and your organization. And we're looking forward to doing a lot more with you. Same here. Yeah. Doug, just uh, maybe by way of background, could you give us a little pr- personal history on sure. you know, where you're from and where you went to school? Yeah, not to not to bore everyone with uh, that uh, personal history, but I I, I am from uh, New England originally. I grew up outside of Boston, and uh, while I was in high school and uh, in college, my dad worked for Cushman and Wakefield in New York City. So my my early introduction to commercial real estate was uh, as a summer intern running for uh, tenant rep and landlord rep and investment sales brokers at Cushman Wakefield. And that was uh, just a, a great early uh, education. Um, basically, at, at that point, uh, many, many years ago, I was uh, effectively co-star. Co-star was not around. And so I had to run around and provide uh, surveys in terms of available space and pricing for office buildings in uh, Stanford, Connecticut. I had to put together a survey of all industrial real estate in uh, Fairfield County, Connecticut. And uh, it was it was great, you know, and in, 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 in developing relationships with uh, the, the big personalities among the bro- brokerage really uh, created a, a, a significant inter- interest for me in in uh, in commercial real estate. Coming coming out of undergrad, uh, I went down to uh, Wall Street and I worked in, uh, as Nate, you mentioned, real estate investment banking uh, shops, uh, um, Merrill Lynch and then Bankers Trust, uh, both great alumni networks over many, many years. Uh, Bankers Trust is now, uh, was basically merged in to be part of uh, what is now Deutsche Bank. And uh, we hit one of our cyclical downturns uh, in the real estate industry seems to happen uh, about every decade or so. And uh, at the time in the early 90s, I, I was contemplating uh, whether or not I, I, I should make a move you know, to another industry or not. And I, I took that uh, time to uh, pursue my MBA uh, and um, you know, with a mind towards possibly pivoting. But at the end of the day, I couldn't get the real estate out of my blood uh, and uh, many of my friends in business school were 
looking to move into uh, private equity, either venture or LBO credit, or a number of my uh, classmates uh, started hedge funds. And uh, I decided I wanted to marry private equity and real estate. But at the time, uh, coming out of business school in 1993, there were not that many people that were doing it. Um, Barry Sternlich was just getting into business. Blackstone hadn't even started their real estate group. And so I had to work hard to find uh, opportunities. Um, but that was my priority. And at the top of my list was a pretty famous entrepreneur here in Chicago by the name of Sam Zell. So, you know, given my entrepreneurial streak, which really goes back to uh, even before high school and college running for brokers, I I, uh, I had a a paper, a downtown paper route in Wayland, Massachusetts. And uh, I would I would knock on doors, door to door to build up that paper route. I ended up selling it at a big profit to someone else. And so I always had this entrepreneurial streak in me. And uh, and so I, I uh, took a page out of that book and I cold called Sam Zell and I invited him to come speak on campus at, at Harvard. And he was intrigued by that and flew in on his jet. I went to pick him up and uh, you know escorted him to a big auditorium at Harvard Business School. And he presented in front of probably a few hundred students and I don't know if you know Sam Zell, but he's uh, he's quite a character, and he, I, he enjoyed it. The students enjoyed it, and uh, one of the points he made uh, was that you know I don't know why you guys pay all this money for for an MBA. You know, it's you know you don't really learn anything, and uh, you know if you were to come work for me, I would give you a true MBA. So on my ride back, when I was driving him back to his airplane, I said, hey, I'd, I'd like to sign up for one of those MBAs. And uh, one thing led to another. And that brought me to Chicago. I, I worked uh, closely with a small team. Uh, I had equity institutional investors under Sam Zell. I had a lot of direct exposure to him. But at the end of the day, he was uh, transitioning his organization away from the private equity model and to public REIT securitization. He took um, is manufactured housing community company, which was hometown, uh, which was um, uh, ma uh, MHC manufactured home communities, which is now lifestyle communities, public, took his uh, a multifamily portfolio public uh, in EQR, equity residential. Eventually, you know, he positioned his office portfolio to take that public in an equity office and ultimately sold that uh, company to Blackstone. So, you know, a small group of us really um, wanted to continue uh, in the private equity model, and we left with his blessing to start the predecessor firm to to Promark. And originally, we were backed by the founder of Trans Western, uh, and uh, he helped get us into business. Uh, coming out of the global financial crisis, we 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 went our separate ways. He kept his brand name. We rebranded as Promark. We brought all of the institutional capital with us, and um, you know, continued with our our our, our um, very successful mezzanine debt fund business. So uh, that's where Nate we made our investment uh, with you in Wisconsin and Madison out of Mez Fund Five, and then we've also been active in middle market value add equity, uh, which is interesting because uh, 12 years ago, coming out of the global financial crisis, we were probably 85% weighted in our portfolio to office. And, um, you know, we learned some valuable lessons the hard way and we pivoted to the point where now we're probably 80, 85% multifamily and, and approaching only 10% in office, which has been um, very successful for us uh, over the years. So that's, you know, that's a short history here. Um, then again, personally, one of the hardest things I ever had to do was convince my girlfriend at the time now wife of many years to also leave the East Coast. Uh, she's from outside of Boston originally. We started dating when we were both investment bankers in New York, and she really was not interested in moving to the Midwest, but I convinced her, and and uh, we've raised our two uh, young adult uh, children now um, in Chicago, and uh, you know we've been in Chicago for over 30 years, and it, it's been uh, nothing but a great, great move for us. And she still likes Chicago, obviously. She does. Yeah, we we have to uh, occasionally get our fix of the East Coast on some uh, some summertime. But uh, yeah, no, we're we're thrilled. We we live right in the city. We uh, 
we had been in a house on the north side, not far from Wrigley Field, and we've um, downsized with the kids up and out, um, uh, and now live in an apartment downtown. Really? Wow. So you're the like case study for us of empty nesters who are yeah, so we we are we are empty nesters. Although we have our cat and our dog. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Okay, I have so many questions now from just yeah. your like career timeline. Yeah, um, we're- Oh, in 1990, you said you pivoted and you were thinking about maybe going somewhere else other than real estate. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was, what was the something else? Yeah, it was funny, you know, because this is actually, this was uh, my, my, my girlfriend at the time, uh, Susan, was applying to business schools. And, I, you know, I had, uh, I had sort of already made that leap. I had been promoted from analyst to associate when I made the move from Merrill to Bankers Trust. So, I really didn't need the MBA to, you know, come back into real estate investment banking. But, you know, at that point in time in um, 1991, Morgan Stanley was laying off half their real estate investment banking group. Goldman Sachs was laying off half their investment banking group. I thought I was going to be sort of life out last in, first out. And uh, I, 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 I looked at Susan's applications and I said, oh, maybe I should fill out one of these. But I was late to the game and signing up for that GMAT test. I eventually took it. But the only MBA program in the country that would accept my uh, application at that point in time was Harvard. So I filled it out and I was fortunately one and done. But at the time, I, you know, and, and sure enough, the layoffs came. Uh, I went to Banker's Trust and said, look, I've got a hard decision to make. And, um, you know, it was, again, this is one of our classic cyclical downturns where, you know, there was significant supply coming online. We hit uh, a recessionary period. So at the same time, the occupancy demand was pulling back. Um, there was only a fraction of the liquidity in the capital markets at that point in time, both debt and equity, because REIT securitization wasn't around. CMBS securitization wasn't around. Fannie and Freddie weren't as active as they were. So, you know, it was a, a significant um, sort of blip in terms of uh, liquidity um, valuation. And so I went to business school thinking that I might have to pivot into another industry. In fact, I spent the summer in between first and second year uh, uh, in natural resources, real assets with uh, with another investment banking firm, thinking that that might be interested. It's sort of a little bit, um, it's certainly related and, and close in many ways in terms of risk return to commercial real estate. And uh, I had a great summer, but then, you know, to my point earlier, I, I couldn't get the real estate out of my blood and I found the seat with Sam Zell. Yeah. And so when you found the seat with Sam Zell and you started working for him, did he kind of immediately want you to start up the REIT program and switch from private equity into a REIT or did you kind of just do some operation stuff initially for him and then go into the REIT? No, good, good question. Uh, Mainly, you know, because of my past background in, in real estate finance, I, I, I I always migrated to sort of a capital markets role and, and at Zell, I, I, I moved into a, in equity capital markets role where I was on the front lines raising equity capital for the Zell Merrill Lynch Opportunity Fund series. And then I developed a reputation for being able to, you know, run um uh pretty um um uh complicated uh models. And so that led me to doing some work on the corporate side of her, his business for the Zell Chillmark um opportunity fund, which was buying distressed corporate assets. And um, and then I also had some involvement in, in some of the financing activity that was being done. Um, so as he was really um, positioning his his real estate portfolios to go public uh, with the REIT securitization, that's when you know myself and and uh, three others. So there were two senior partners, and I was one of two junior partners that all had similar backgrounds. My my three other partners were all. They were all Harvard Business School as well, and they were they were all Goldman Sachs. So I was the only non Goldman Sachs investment banker as part of that group that left to to start the predecessor firm to uh, Promart. Interesting. And just for our audience that maybe isn't super familiar with REITs, could you give us like a little introduction into what a REIT is versus what private equity is? 
Yeah, it gets it gets complicated. I mean, the REIT structure is really a tax structure, and it's a it's it's a, it's it's basically kind of a a, a, a pass through uh, tax structure that enables the 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 um, corporate entity not pay, not to pay corporate tax by flowing through you know uh, you know a certain percentage of their distributable income that. Uh, emanates from uh rents on commercial real estate then um the the corporate entity does not have to pay corporate tax and so publicly traded REITs are are that way but there are also private REIT structures as well so you know Blackstone has you know famously and Starwood now famously have large private REIT structures that utilize that same pass through where um, you know tax is just paid by the investors on the income uh, they receive. Uh, that being said, um, you know private equity is 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 has typically been sort of a, a general partner, limited partner fund structure. Often it's been a closed end fund structure, so you have a finite uh, period to uh, invest commitments that are raised, and then you have a finite. Uh, investment period um, by which you you should be selling the assets that you've acquired into that fund, and sometimes these days you you combine both the the private equity fund closed end fund concept with a REIT structure depending on who your investors are. So it it, it moves around, but essentially the, the the big publicly traded REITs are are exactly as I described. The, they do not pay corporate tax because they're flowing through to their shareholders, the income derived from rents. Yeah. And just for those audience that maybe don't know what REIT stands for, it's Real Estate Investment Trust. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a lot of jargon in real estate. I Sometimes you got to call me on it because, you know, you, so, you sometimes you just assume everybody knows what a, a REIT is, but that's exactly right. A Real Estate Investment Trust. And it can be either publicly traded or it can be private. Yeah. So just so we have a clear timeline, so 1990, went back to Harvard Business School, then you had this awesome uh, introduction to Sam Zell, worked for Sam Zell for a little bit, yep. did private equity and REITs, and then you broke off and you spinned off on your own. But when you you spun off on your own, you first started something other than Promark, is that right? Well, it was really the predecessor firm. I mean, it was the, you know, it was the basis and, and, and we, you know, we look at our track record, uh, you know, that we have, um, you know, that we've had as a team, but yeah, there was a, there was an original company called Transwestern Investment Company. We were backed by the founder, Robert Duncan of Transwestern. And, um, you know, we were uh, partners with Transwestern in that investment business from 1996 to, I want to say, uh, 2010. And then we went our separate ways. We bought, we bought, um, you know, we bought out the Transwestern interest and then, you know, they kept their name and we rebranded as Pearlmark right around 2010. And yeah, that was you and one other partner from Transwestern that did that. Yeah, so you know, uh, it was it was largely me and and um, my my partner of many years, uh, our CEO Steve Quazzo. Cool. And then you guys basically have been running Promark since 2010. Yeah, and you could argue that we were you know we were also running the predecessor firm going back to '96 as well. Wow. And you said that when you started kind of this new firm with Transwestern and then turning into Promark, it was heavily focused on office and since Yeah, not entirely though. We did early on, we we did we were active in, in office, um, you know, industrial, flex industrial, so smaller bay. We we did some active investing there. We we created a company in the manufactured housing community sector, uh, a, a, a company called Hometown America, which was acquired by the state of Washington, and that was a huge success for us. And then we got into multifamily when Doug Crocker, who was the original CEO for EQR when it went public, Equity Residential, he retired and his non-competes burned off. And uh, he came to help us get into the multifamily business. And that was really important for us um, as we got into that sector. And we've really 
if you look at what we've been doing over the last decade, it's been heavily in multifamily. Okay, so the office was more kind of in the early 2000s. And yeah, so- but yeah, yeah, and then and then you know we were heavily office, uh, you know, in, in, into the the teeth of the global financial crisis, and that you know that was that was painful. You know, we had uh, we had a lot of heavy lifting to do. Um, you know, but a lot of what you're seeing today in office was, uh, was, uh, similarly evident in the global financial crisis. And, you know, what happens with office, which is very capital intensive, you know, when the absorption dries up and the liquidity dries up, you know, it's not just basis, it's what's the capital required to, you know, invest even more to, you know, stabilize, uh, an asset and those capital requirements in office, um, assets can be quite significant as you're probably aware. So we, we just, you know, we, we, we chose to move to, you know, um, multifamily in particular, followed by industrial that are generally less, uh, capital intensive. We also, you know, purposely, uh, chose to focus on, on middle market and, 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 um, you know, growth markets. So that moved us away from the large cap markets of New York, um, Chicago, you know, we used to be very actively invested here in Chicago. We haven't been for a while. Uh, we used to be actively invested in, in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And instead we moved to, uh, markets like, uh, Nashville, Tennessee and Charlotte and Dallas and San Antonio and Madison. <laughs> it's a little bit of an outlier, but we, you know, we love, you know, Madison, you know, fits the bill for us because in terms of target markets, we love uh, state capitals with a with a with a strong university presence and a strong hospital presence. We just find that those economies are a lot more resilient, and and we we've, we've had a lot of success in 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 places like that. Madison fits that bill, but so does uh, Nashville, right? So does Raleigh. Um, you know, there there are other markets. Austin, Texas, historically has fit you know that description as well. Yeah. So when you look at a market and we'll come back to my other question about office pivot, but when you look at a market, be it low, like low size, mid size, or even kind of large cap, like Chicago, what are the big kind of key indicators that you're looking for? Is it university towns? Is it capital towns? All the above or? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, I think it's a simple saying, you know, if it's a, if it's a hundred million or greater asset, you know, maybe there's a little flex in there, but generally, you know, if it's going to be, you know, well over a hundred million in, in gross asset value, you know, that's probably, you know, it's borderline as to whether or not it's middle market or not. And just, you know, most, you know, if you're looking at anything in, in downtown Chicago or downtown New York, by definition, you're probably going to be 200 million or greater. So it, uh, you know, for us, it's, it's asset size, but, you know, coming back to the markets, we also are looking at, at job growth and, and, and Chicago has not been great on that front. And, you know, we've seen a lot of jobs move from, from New York. We've seen a lot of jobs move from blue states to red states. And so, so we're picking up some of those dynamics as well. Yeah, just circling back to the timeline, and then I want to get back to that kind of current state of the market. Yeah. Uh, so after you did that office to kind of flex industrial and multifamily pivot for yeah. promo, how did your investor like structure change? Because I'm sure that you had some investors that wanted office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Invested in funds because you had a lot of office, and other investors maybe only wanted multifamily. Or did you not really see that from your investor pool? No, I think well there there was a there was a pivot and it had to do with you know uh, emerging from the global financial crisis um, and we at the time had some dry powder in some of those larger allocator funds we had raised pre global financial crisis so we raised significant uh, equity for uh, you know a, a broader uh, discretionary fund vehicle. Um, you know, in, in like 2006 to 2008, we raised some money. We, we didn't fully invest it. And so we had some dry powder coming out of the global financial crisis, but we, we pivoted away from, on the equity side of our book, we pivoted away from um, these, these larger um, 
closed end fund vehicles and we went to single asset and portfolio capitalizations with the benefit of a GP equity fund. So we raised a smaller fund, call it 35 million, that would write half a million to two and a half million GP or co GP checks. And then each transaction would get separately capitalized. We'd bring LP uh, capital in, depending on the check size, it would be Goldman Sachs or you know Oak Tree or Alliance Bernstein, or if, if we were doing some you know smaller middle market, then we were doing you know uh, family office uh, 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 a couple of the family office investors in our GP equity fund would write LP checks themselves, and then we took our promote deal by deal, and so we did that for probably about a dozen years with that thirty five. Uh, million dollar GP equity fund, we ended up doing over a billion in gross investment, you know, by by raising the LP capital and the debt deal by deal. And we we generated a phenomenal track record on the equity side. By the way, now we pivoted back and we have raised our first uh, closed end discretionary value add fund, which we're calling Promark Equity Partners 2. So we had a first closing last year, just under 150 million, and we're still raising capital for that fund. You know, to do the equity, middle market, multifamily, and uh, industrial. So now we're sort of coming full circle. We're going back to the fund model. But I will say, and I didn't, I didn't touch on. You know, we got into the credit side of our business in 2001. So. We were pretty early for a private equity fund to get into a credit strategy, and that's because we were invited to co-sponsor originally with the old Mutual New York Insurance Company, and there we've continued with a fund model. So uh, our investment with you is through Mez Fund Five. We're uh, rapidly finishing out investment on Mez Fund Five, um, and we're we're about to uh, raise Mez Fund Six. You know, over that uh, history within our firm. Uh, we've done, I think, approaching 160 different MES loans, and we've done over two billion in mezzanine lending. And so we're, uh, for a small firm, we're, we're one of the more active mezzanine lenders out there. And it's been really good for us to be both um, an active private equity investor as well as an active mezzanine credit lender because we we see a lot of opportunity. We can decide where we want to play up and down the capital stack. You know, a lot of our um, MES borrowers, sometimes, you know, they know that we're an equity investor. We've had um, joint venture equity investors who know of our MES program and say, hey, I'd like to borrow some of those dollars over there, depending on the situation. So there's there's a lot of synergy there. And then just, you know, taking a, a really, you know, bottom up sort of valuation perspective driven by, uh, you know, our 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 firm assessment of cash flows and valuation. We're, we're not your typical lender that way. And when we first got into the credit business, I I worried, you know, are, are some of our friendly competitors really going to want to borrow money from us? Um, but they quickly saw that we're a balance sheet lender and that we actually understand the borrower's perspective and we can be very creative and we're very commercial and reasonable in terms of our approach to documentation. So, it's been it's been a good business for us. Yeah, no, I can attest. You guys are great partners. It's been very easy to work with your team. Uh, one, so one question I have for you on that: when you did, and you said in two thousand one, you started your credit strategy. Back then, did you kind of was that a big part of your business, or was it mostly equity uh, back then? Because it seems well, like yeah. I think back then, you know, it was just, uh, you know, it, it was a very small part of our business. I think that first mezzanine fund was maybe 150 million. Actually, it was, I have it right here. It was 151.9 million. It's not a, it's framed, you know, it's one of those tombstones. Yeah, nice. Mez fund one was 151.91 million. <laughs> but, you know, at the time, you know, at the time we probably had, I don't know, we probably had, you know, we had a few billion, you know, two to three billion in assets under management at that point in time. So, yeah, it was it was uh, small. I would say right now, though, you know, the 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 mess side of our business is is probably half of what we're doing. So, Promark Equity Partners to the equity fund we're raising, we're looking to scale that. We had our first closing last year. You know, uh, we're 
probably about 150 million in that fund on our way to 300 million. We're already talking to our lead investors on MES Fund uh, 6, and that's probably going to be you know a $400 million fund, and we're probably going to have another couple hundred million of co-investment stacked up alongside. So I, honestly, right now, even even right right now, given what we're seeing in the capital markets, last year we we did we were quiet. We did three equity investments and we did six mezzanine loans. Already this year, um, we haven't closed an equity investment, but we've already closed uh, three mezzanine loans. Just wow, eight, and uh, we've got three others sort of in the pipeline. So it's, it's, we're a lot more active right now on the credit side. Yeah. Cause I would think like back in like the early two thousands, when you had senior loans going up to 70, even 80%, 90%, right. Mezzanine really isn't needed, but yeah. now we can only get like 55, 60 if we're lucky. Or less. Yeah. yeah. We're seeing some of the senior construction lenders that more like 45 these days. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like you have to use MES, otherwise your IRRs are in like the the high high numbers of like nine to ten percent, which is not acceptable. So, yeah, it seems like it's like such a great business right now, given the current financial market. So good, yeah, we're looking to make yeah. a. You know, I I happen to think it's it's a good business. You know, in 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 most cycles, I think at times, like you know when. You know, when the capital markets are extremely competitive and, and you're asking, you're being asked to go to 85 or 90 cents on the dollar, last dollar on MES, and you're subordinate to a 75% or 80% senior, that that doesn't feel great. And we have seen that from time to time in past cycles. But you can pick your spots. You can pick your, you know, your 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 asset types. You can pick your markets. You can pick your sponsors. I mean, we like to say that you know, a high level, um, we focus on asset quality, focus on um, the strength of the sub market, and then we focus on structure, you know, the intercreditor agreement and additional collateral support. And, um, you know, you better check, you know, you, you can't be, uh, you can't be extremely deficient on any one of those, but, but two out of three, you better check strongly to make up for one of the three. So maybe you could be, you know, a little more accommodating on structure, but you better have a really high quality asset and strong sponsorship. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Your underwriting methodology. Do you always require that you have like strong sponsorship, a strong asset, a strong balance sheet? Or do you sometimes find that like if you have a strong balance sheet and a strong sponsor, you could maybe have like a mediocre mediocre project that you guys still will likely get repaid on now the equity making money. Maybe that's another story, but obviously that's not your concern, but have you found yourself in that situation where it's like, Hey, we really like the sponsor. They have a great balance sheet. We're not super sure about the project, but we're going to do it anyways. You know, it's, it's a good question. I mean, it, it, it just depends on your, 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 your definition, right? Because, you know, m maybe it's an older asset, but it's got, um, you know, a a really strong credit tenant in there for a long period of time. And so, you know, we look at the strength of the cash flows and that can sometimes make up for the, the asset quality. So there are some variations there. I, I, I would want to be careful on asset quality because at the end of the day, you know, that is our collateral. And, um, you know, we, we always want to focus on strong sponsorship. Um, you know, we don't want to do business you know, with people, you know, who don't check out in terms of, um, um, you know, doing what they're, what they say they, they can do, but also, you know, are going to do the right thing. You know, if there's any sort of history of malfeasance, then we won't touch sponsorship. And I don't think that, you know, additional collateral support or credit can make up for, you know, bad sponsorship. So that, that's a tough one. But to your point on on asset quality, I, I think structurally you might be able to, you know, um, work, you know, with a strong sponsor. Maybe there's some additional collateral support that, you know, once you get comfortable with the, or more comfortable with the asset quality, um, maybe maybe it's a maybe it's a high quality asset, but it's it's under leased, right? Or maybe it's a development project and you've got great sponsorship. 
but you don't have any tenancy, but you're 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 going to structure with a completion guarantee and you're going to make sure that you know net worth and liquidity are there to backstop the guarantor, to backstop the completion guarantee. So there are all sorts of things you can do um, to you know uh, make up for a, a lack of cash flow. Uh, but at the end of the day, for example, in a development deal like we financed with you, we just felt like it was such a well located, high quality asset. You know, once you complete it, you're going to be able to lease it. Um, and so, you know, for us, the the credit support there were were largely the the guarantees behind the completion. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Well, I wanted to make sure we have enough time for our last three segments. So, switching into the next segment of current state of the capital markets, I know kind of been going through some turbulence the last twelve to twenty four months. Really, actually, since we've closed Baker's, I feel like yeah. Baker's was closed in this like little window of time that uh, we had some sunshine, so to speak, and now we've uh, had some clouds. And so what are what are you seeing right now in the capital markets last year and then kind of also going into this year? Yeah, look, last year was a very challenging year. I, I, I think you need to you, you need to make some distinctions between the various asset classes. We, we've had some discussion on that. Office is extremely challenged right now. Uh, if, you, if you just look at uncertainty over demand for office, uh, given, you know, um, you know, coming through COVID and, you know, a lot of the flexibility in the workplace, uh, work from home, you know, companies being a lot more efficient in terms of their, their, their footprint and their demand for occupancy. Uh, the fact that a lot of the office now is, is functionally obsolete, you know, from a technology standpoint, from a systems and air quality standpoint. Uh, so, so there, there are a lot of challenges. And when you layer, uh, into that, the whole discussion on capital markets and, and liquidity and, and the fact that, um, you know, so many, uh, existing lenders with office exposure are now, you know, basically in ownership positions or closures or sales. Um, it's, it, it's tough. And so valuation for offices plummeted, you know, over time, you know, a lot of this, um, office will be repurposed, but the, the, the basis has to go down to very low levels to justify, you know, investment, uh, to, to repurpose into medical office or, um, apartment living. And, um, you know, a lot of the CBD downtown assets just based on vintage and you know, where they sit mid block, you know, may never be suitable for multifamily. Um, so I, I'd say office is, you know, clearly the poster child right now. Uh, but you're not immune in other asset classes. Um, there was a lot of, um, you know, um, aggressive buying and multifamily at very low cap rates. We've seen a rapid rise in interest rates over a very short period of time, and it's not clear what that means for, you know, where ultimately people will be valuing real estate um, that's that's um, stabilized even in multifamily and or industrial. A lot of people say that, you know, what used to be maybe a four, four and a half cap rate is now maybe a five, five and a half rate cap, a five, five and a half percent uh, cap rate. Uh, but, you know, where, where, where is that 10 year bench? benchmark uh, treasury going to settle out and what is the risk premium associated, you know, even for a multifamily asset relative to an industrial asset relative to, you know, I guess we're throwing, throwing office out the window right now. Um, so even multifamily is going to be challenged. There, there, there are a ton of uh, debt maturities coming up. Uh, and um, at the same time, you've got a lot of the, the the banks that were very active lenders. If you look at the overall uh, commercial real estate lending market, banks have a 50% market share. Think about that. Wow. Banks hold about half of all of the commercial real estate loans and they're not lending. And a lot of those loans are coming up. So who's going to fill, you know, who's going to fill that back? Yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. I, well, look, I think the insurance companies are stepping up a little. That's a big part of our client base. Um, you know, the agencies are still active. Private credit is stepping up to fill some of the vacuum, but 
you know, I think the combination of uncertainty on on valuation, multifamily, you've got some pockets of oversupply, you've got issues of affordability on rents, so rents not growing, maybe pulling back a little. You know, you're going to have issues in in what has been a very strong asset class, multifamily. There's some there's some uh, clouds on the horizon there too. Do you think that there is a distinction between certain markets? Because I think one thing I've been doing some research on is just looking at like, I mean, we can take one market, for example, Oakland, California has had this huge oversupply and like just looking at their absorption numbers, it's going to probably take like five years for yeah. them to absorb just currently what's been delivered. Yeah, you know, I take I think you gotta you gotta look at it market by market. That was one of the reasons why we were so attracted to Madison. You got, you know, very, you know, tight, tight vacancy and and even with some of the new construction, you know, the demand is so clearly there. And then you contrast that to Oakland and and look, Oakland's got other issues too. I mean, crime, you know, is an issue. I mean, we've got you know, we have to address some of those issues here in Chicago as well. But Oakland's uh, very much up there in terms of, you know, not only having all of that supply, but, you know, are you going to get in, are you going to get in migration uh, to go fill some of that supply? And some people are concerned about crime in, in that particular submarket. So do you guys look at it kind of when you're assessing a uh, potential project to either do equity on or, or mezzanine financing? You got to look at the market instead of the macroeconomics and make a decision. Yeah, definitely. We're gonna dip. We're gonna dig in, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at. Um, you know, we you know we have a little bit of a cushion on the on the credit side, right? Um, you know, because you know we can we can we can play with our last dollar exposure in terms of the amount of loan proceeds we're willing to advance. But on the equity side, you've got to be pretty precise. And yeah, we're digging in and we're, we're looking at, you know, we focus a lot on, on what should the rental great growth be. And you got to take into account, you know, uh, net effective rents today. So net of concessions and what, what's the growth. And so we, we, uh, subscribe to CoStar, Axio, Yardi, and we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, which of those, um, algorithm models we think is stronger in terms of the the particular submarket that they're focused on relative to the asset we're underwriting and then we're going to do a detailed analysis on new supply and you know how does that play out in terms of you know which of those models will go with in terms of rental rate growth but yeah we're digging in and then we're you know absolutely every time we look at an investment we're we're looking at crime stats you know, it's like, it's, it's front and center in each of our investment committee write-ups. And why is crime set such a big statistic for you? Well, because we think that there's a, there's a, a direct relation to a sponsor's ability to rent the units, uh, depending on how safe that submarket is. Interesting. Okay. And so circling back to kind of current state of the capital markets, one of the things you said is, uh, where is the tenure going to settle out? And yeah. I think, uh, what is your crystal ball of, of where it's going to settle out? Cause I, I have my ideas, but I think it's anyone's guess at this point. Yeah. I, you know, first of all, we don't make bets on what I think, you know, we are t typically taking what the forward, uh, capital markets curve shows as we're trying to make decisions. But one thing's for sure that that forward curve is always wrong, right? It's never completely right. It's it's you know either going to be wrong, you know, too high or wrong too low. And it's been changing a ton lately. I mean, every week I look at it and it's like, wait, this is way different than last week. And that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons we've kind of struggled on the equity side is because there there is a ton of volatility, and you know we had, you know, the ten year Treasury was down well under four percent, and everybody was thinking, well, if it's you know if if it's going down to three and a half, then you know, maybe we could look at five cap rates and be comfortable with that. But now that it's back up to four and a quarter, you know, what should the cap rate be? It's, 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 uh, what should be the, what should the risk premium be? You know, it's, it's gotta be, I think it's gotta be at least a hundred basis points. So if you're pricing today at four and a quarter, then you're, then you're at five and a quarter on your exit cap rate on your, on your best asset. 
on your right. best asset. But where is the ten-year Treasury going to be? Look, I think I think they're going to keep I think they're going to keep rates um, relatively high for longer, you know, than what the SOFR curve is suggesting. But by doing that, I think um, you know they're going to try and influence that ten-year Treasury to a lower rate. The, the problem is, you know, you just you look at um, you know our 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 ballooning federal deficit and you know you can do all you want on the monetary policy uh to try and influence but at the end of the day you know as we as as, as a nation we take on more and more debt then it's going to be more and more challenging to bring that 10-year treasury down because you need to entice you know people to buy those bonds and and once you know we you know we're at these astronomical levels in terms of federal debt it's 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 more and more challenging to do that's something i actually been thinking about and i I want to do some more research on this but one of the things that i've been looking at is soon our interest is going to be the most expensive item in our national budget yeah just the interest expense and so i've been thinking about that of like is the federal reserve going to start noticing that and have to bring rates down even though that like for us to get people to buy bonds nationally, we might have to keep them up. Yeah. But how high can we keep them up with also bearing the interest expense? That it's like this weird dichotomy between the two. Yep. No, that's the tension we were just talking about for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so your crystal ball is it's coming down, but not for a while. Uh, my crystal ball is that I, yeah, well, I guess I'm, I'm being hopeful too. I, I, I think uh, I think it will come down, but I, I don't I don't see us going back to you know two and a half or three percent. I don't see us going back down that low. You think it's going to be like three point five four? How is that affecting how you guys uh, kind of look at pricing for your mezzanine funds? You know we've we've gotten more conservative on our uh, our assumption of of exit cap rate. You know I think right now even for the the like, the highest quality asset, you know, we're probably assuming uh, certainly five and a quarter, probably five and a half. It would be our our best um, exit cap rate assumption, you know, in terms of the lowest. Well, when you say exit cap rate, are you looking at like exit cap rate for sale or are you just looking at what are they going to refi and what's the valuation at refi? Because that's really what you guys are needing is to get out. Yeah, so we 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 look we look at both. So when I say exit cap rate, it's usually with an assumed hold on the asset for our loan period. So you know, it's a three or four year loan term. We're looking at what we think stabilized cash flow will be in you know years four or five, and we're we're capping that for a value, and then we're looking at our loan balance relative to what we think is financeable. Uh, versus that value and and cash flow level. So today, we want to be we want to be seventy five percent or less on stabilized uh, on fully accrued balance relative to stabilized um, value, and then we want to be at sort of seven and a half, approaching eight percent debt yield. And what you'll see in in those metrics today, given our higher interest rate environment in multifamily, is that an agency financing probably doesn't take us out of our mess, but an agency financing plus some prep or some additional cash in will take us out. But a bridge loan, a bridge loan will take us out. So, so if the if the sponsor at that point in time doesn't want to put cash in to lock in a you know Fannie or Freddie fixed rate, they can they can t- they can take a, a bridge loan to pay us off. And then you know look to sell or refinance, or at that point you know we're 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 we know we're money good because we're at seventy five percent or less on value, but often at that point you know the the the, the sponsor is probably wanting to stay with the hold a little bit longer. So again, it's it it's either you know refinance with a longer term fixed rate at that point in time, probably with some cash in, or it's refinance out the original construction loan and mez with a with a bridge that would then bridge to a sale or a permanent refi and 
That was one question I had for you with the current financial markets. Is Promark looking at maybe doing some bridge loans? Yeah, look, I mean, we're, um, you know, right now we're kind of focusing on our, our middle market value add equity and our, our, our meds, but, um, you know, I don't think it would be crazy to think that at some point, you know, possibly we might get into some senior lending as well. We could do some stretch senior out of our meds fund and then lay off an A note or, you know, do some note on note financing to, in effect, manufacture uh, a mezzanine return. Historically, we haven't done a lot of that. I think we'll do some of that out of our $400 million MES 6 fund. Uh, but, you know, at some point, who knows, maybe maybe we get into the senior lending business as well. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like an interesting value proposition with where the financial markets have been and are currently because it's just yeah, that and the, and not enough liquidity. Yeah. The fact that the banks aren't lending. So maybe why not try and fill some of that market share? Yeah. Okay, getting into our last section here about mass timber financing and the green premium. Yeah. Uh, one one big question I get asked a lot is who financed your project? Because it's always like, oh, it's this new material. Banks don't like it. People are scared. And I always say, well, we had a really good experience with Bank OZK and Probar. Yeah. And so my question for you is what got you guys comfortable with doing something that's maybe kind of novel and new called mass timber? Yeah, I think for us it was uh, it was a combination of um, you know we talked about it earlier Madison just being an outstanding multifamily market. Um, we like the fact that it was strong local sponsorship. You guys are a relatively new firm, but you you're you're you know from Wisconsin and and you know that market really well. And you know your 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 team came from different teams, um, you know that all had some great direct applicable experience in 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 Madison and in Wisconsin. So we, we like that. Um, you know, I would say, you know, one of the things that was a challenge for us that we had to overcome was um, you know, the 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 the, the cost uh, of, of development was a little bit higher in terms of per unit, you know, than we had seen um you know, part of that was, I think, a function of the of the outstanding uh, location, so the site in in Madison. Um, and then when we were looking to underwrite rents, um, you were you were strong in your conviction that you were going to see a premium on on rents in in Madison, and so it was incumbent on us to, you know, get comfortable with 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 that um, um, and. You know, we're again, we're a lender and we're lending at, you know, uh, an advance rate with you and equity. So we didn't have to get completely comfortable with your rents. We had to get comfortable with our rents. But, you know, we looked we looked at the the direct um, um, pump uh, for mass timber in, in Milwaukee and walked that project and the quality of that project and and the, the premium and rents that was achieved there. And that, that, that made us a little more comfortable in terms of the underwriting, um, for Baker's place in Madison. Interesting. Yeah. That project in Milwaukee, the Ascend, uh, I just actually talked with the owner last week. We had lunch together. Mm-hmm. And I got some really positive news. They just came up on their one year renewals this fall from opening cause they opened in 22. And they had a 70% retention rate on all their renewals. I'm not surprised. Yeah. And they, the, apparently they had like a questionnaire go out to a lot of their tenants asking why are they picking us over some other towers that are delivering in downtown Milwaukee right now with Hines is delivering a tower, which is really nice. And there's another local developer delivering a tower. And the resounding response was we really like the mass timber feeling. So no, no, no. And, and we also we we felt strongly that you know conceptually. I mean, look, we had to we had to you know do our homework, and you know there's so many challenges just because it's such a new concept. So you know, are you going to get the regulatory approvals? Um, you know, the the whole misconception about you know the risk of fire when you know in fact uh, it's less risky with. Uh, with uh, this particular product for many reasons. Um, so you, you just need to go through all of that and do your homework. And, um, you know, we also felt like, uh, that, 
you know, the nature of the project in terms of checking boxes on sustainability, you know, we're not, we're not Europe yet, but if you look at what's happened um, in the commercial real estate capital markets for sustainable projects, including mass timber in, in, um, in Europe, uh, you know, there clearly is the green premium, which means for a sponsor, you, you get, you know, uh, a, a reduced interest rate. Um, you know, we're not there yet here in the U S but I think we're moving in that direction and it's all about education and ultimately it's going to be, um, you know, supported by the experiences like you just described at a set where, you know, in particular in, in a community like Madison, which we talked about earlier, you know, you know, state capital, big university presence, big hospital presence, a lot of people that care deeply about the environment, having that type of community, this this kind of project, uh, this kind of sustainable project utilizing mass timber, we think is going to be very, very appealing to the tenant base. And so yeah. that got us comfortable with assuming, you know, some higher rents that probably, you know, were a little bit a little bit higher than what other competitive class A assets today in Madison are achieving. Yeah. Yeah, we actually, there's another building that just opened up the street from us that's like luxury art deco designed. And they uh, just got done with their lease up and they're almost 10% higher than we are. So we're they were now looking at our rents again and we're like, wow, that's crazy. Which I think it's mostly just attributed to how narrow the supply is in Madison, 99.1% occupied. So it's just like, there's really... Everything that comes on the market is getting absorbed, which is great. Um, okay, so I have a question for you then on the sustainability front. Does Promark have like specific requirements from its investors to like invest in sustainably focused developments? We don't have we don't have specific requirements at this point in time, but you know we're 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 moving uh, down a path where um, sustainability is a, a big part of everything we do. For example, every time we look at a new investment, we, we, uh, we analyze, um, um, you know, the, the pros and cons, uh, from a sustainability standpoint. And so it's actually written up and addressed in each and every investment committee memo. So for example, on Baker's place, you know, a big part of, um, you know, the, you know, the success of, of mass timber, timber, as it relates to, uh, carbon footprint um and uh other issues um you know the way in which the mass timber is 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 um produced you know through sustainable forestry you know those are issues that um are very important uh to our investor base and so we 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 make those um a specific section within our investment committee um right up the other thing that's happening with with Pearlmark um, is we're part of a, a larger investment management uh, organization that um, is in process with with a, a merger with a larger uh, insurance company organization that's European based. And as I mentioned earlier, Europe is just a lot further advanced on 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 this type of focus. So I think with our our new strategic relationship. Uh, not only are we going to have access to pretty significant amounts of capital in the future through this new relationship, but a, a lot of it might be coming from Europe, which will have a even higher focus on these issues. Interesting. And so is it something that has been like an internal initiative from Promark that you're kind of driving or is it some... Yeah, no, uh, it, it, it started with us. We, we hired a we hired a consultant that um, you can go to our website. You can see a lot of our work on on you know what we've done and and sustainability and you know each of the ESG factors. Um, you know, I, I I would say you know we're not um, you know we're we're very active as I mentioned up front on the investment side. We're now very active as well in terms of ongoing monitoring in certain areas uh, in asset management. Um, and it's, you know, it's something we're going to continue to focus on. So yeah, yeah. There, there are, um, you know, we, we, and the, the consultant was very good. I mean, basically went through a process, 
interviewed almost everyone in the firm. Almost everyone in the firm took part in 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 the process. Oh wow! Uh, and uh, we looked at a host of different factors and and you know where we can see um, you know early immediate improvements where we're going to have to work you know um, you know into the future. But it's definitely something that um, we look closely at. Yeah. No, that's awesome. One of the other questions I had for you is. And this is more probably selfishly asking, uh, do you think that for like mass timber projects or just like projects with sustainable certificates, like passive house or lead that we're going to see a compression in cap rates at sale? Or, I mean, do you guys even underwrite that or are you always kind of more agnostic and looking at the 10 year treasury and trying to be a hundred basis points above that? Yeah, I wouldn't, I, well, I, w- I wouldn't say we're like, straight and narrow like you just described like it's got to be at least 100 basis points over the 10-year treasury we look at just a wide range of factors i i think um i think with time uh more and more capital will be looking at um these um sustainability initiatives and they'll recognize that you know what's good for client is also really good for tenant demand and so you know to your point earlier if if a mass timber project in in uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin is getting rent premiums and um, they're holding on to seventy percent of their tenant year over year um, versus the competition at fifty to sixty percent, you're just going to see you know a, a better, more durable cash flow that should receive a lower cap rate. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's Definitely, I think something like we talk about is more like, oh, it's just because it's mass timber or just because lead, we're going to see a compression. But it's really these other factors that are necessarily contributed to the sustainability aspects, but really they are. It's just not as direct as we think. It's more because tenants like living in those buildings, they'll live in there longer, they'll pay a little bit more rent, and therefore that has a financial result that compresses the cap rate. Yep. So- Yeah. Well, I know we're up on time, Doug, but I really appreciate you coming on and talking with us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It was super fun. And At The Neutral Project, we're not just building structures. We're building a legacy of sustainability, helping align your investments with a sustainable future. We'd like to thank you for being part of this conversation. For more information and to stay up to date on how we're reshaping the future through environmentally conscious development. Visit our social media accounts or website at theneutralproject.com. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time on The Neutral Podcast.